Thank you for coming out for our uh, second edition of the uh, Calhoun Lecture Series for the 2012-2013 academic year. Um, and we're glad that everyone braved the cold weather that has decided to move in, but at least the rain came through real quickly last night and didn't put that kind of damper on us. Uh, my name's Jeff Allen. I'm the director of the Strom Thurmond Institute. And uh, again, I just want to welcome everyone here this evening. Um, we have a, a really interesting, intriguing program lined up for you tonight. Um, and, uh, and I'll even put a plug in for the, the book, which I have read, um, and it's an incredibly captivating book, uh, a read that's very hard to put down. Um, I do want to introduce, we have a student panel again tonight who's going to ask some questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, Pamela Bork is here. She's a senior in computer engineering from Springfield, Massachusetts, right? Stephen Castro, who's a senior political science major from Woodbine, Maryland, and Heather Waddell, who is an architecture major from close by here, Pelzer, South Carolina. So we're very excited to have them here, and I'm sure they'll ask some excellent questions when the time comes. And after they uh, ask their questions, then we'll open it up to the audience. And right now, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Peter Kent, a good friend and colleague who is going to introduce our speakers this evening. Peter. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, this is the last time you'll see my face because I'm going to, you'll see the top of my head from now on. I, I'm, I'm not very comfortable speaking in public, but I'm so fond of these two that I wanted to do this. So I'm going to read my speech and um, you'll know when I finish. I thought I knew what I was in for on a stormy Sunday afternoon this summer when I went to a book signing at the Easley Public Library, but I was wrong. I had a pretty good idea of what to expect, a presentation, perhaps a reading by the authors, then a couple of dozen well-wishers buying signed copies of the book. No. The place was packed. The book signing line serpentined through the library as Easley turned out to remember one of its own, as did veterans veterans, some in caps ident identifying where they served, others wearing well-worn fatigues from wars at the edge of memory. It was a celebration of a life given and taken, of an exceptional individual, her family, friends, and the legion of many in the band of brothers and sisters with whom she trained and fought our nation's enemies. It is the story of Kimberly Hampton, the fallen pale rider of the dark horse, the moniker of D Troop, 1st Squadron, 17th Cavalry, the Armed Reconnaissance Aviation Squadron of the 82nd Airborne. On January 2nd, 2004, a heat-seeking missile fired by a hidden foe in Fallujah, Iraq, brought down Captain Hampton's Kiowa, Kiowa warrior helicopter, crashing, killing her. Cam Captain Hampton is America's first woman combat pilot killed in battle. The book is Kimberly's Flight, it is the story of Kimberly Hampton, an exempl Hampton's exemplary life told through nearly 50 interviews and Kimberly's own work emails to her family and friends. And it is entwined with her mother, Ann Hampton's narrative of loving and losing a child. Retired award-winning journalist Anna Simon was the reporter from the Greenville News in South Carolina for 21 years. Kimberly's mother met Anna, who was writing a series of stories for the newspaper about Kimberly's life and the reaction in the small southern town of Easley to her death. Tonight we have the authors, Anne Hampton and Anna Sima, with us. I've known Anna for a dozen more years. We share the same accepted deviant behavior. <laughs> that's, that's the description a sociologist used for newspaper reporters in a wonderful article called Socialization in the Newsroom. Newspapers are a roaring madness a business that, through the course of the day, gathers, organizes, and presents its work, then throws it out and starts over again day in and day out. 
A newspaper is a great training academy for writers where you learn that stories matter and telling them well matters too. Anna is a story master and Anne has learned the power of story too. Please welcome Anna Simon and Anne Hampton. Thank you, Peter, and thank you everyone for being here and for your interest. We have a small presentation to make. If Jeff would come back up, we do have a copy of the book <clears throat> for the Cooper Library, and we've signed it for the students. Live your dreams. That's something Kimberly was doing. And Dan wrote, freedom is not free, which Kimberly's story underscores. Peter, he left. <laughs> well, we appreciate this wonderful introduction. We thank you so much for having us here tonight to talk about a subject that's, of course, very dear to me and has been very close to Anna's heart for the last hmm, long time, years. I would like to tell you a little bit about Kimberly. My husband Dale and I had been married 12 years when Kimberly was born. And yes, she was our miracle baby, our only child. For a third grade class project, she was asked in one of these little booklets that they do in grammar school, one of the questions was, if you could have anything or if you could do anything, what would it be? And in her third grade writing, she said, if I could do anything in the world, it would be to fly over the treetops like a bird. Now, I really don't think she had a conscious thought then of being a helicopter pilot or a pilot, maybe like our two cadets here. But when, we, when she finished flight school, I wrapped up this little book and gave it to her. And she was amazed. She was amazed for a couple of reasons because all through the book, she had uh, written and I didn't realize it at the time, but it was a little bit above the third grade level. She said, Mom, couldn't you tell I'm going to be an English major? <laughs> so anyway, her, her determination to excel began at an early age. In fact, one of her elementary school teachers told us that she was too serious about her schoolwork. Well, that ticked her off. And uh, I think it was just um, maybe an incentive for her to try even harder. But that's the way she approached everything that she did. She gave it 110%. Kimberly went to Easley High, as did my husband and me. But we were, we were nowhere on the same level as she was. She was student body president, number one on the tennis team, an honors graduate, and the first cadet battalion commander of the Naval Junior ROTC program. She was nominated Actually, she was recruited to play tennis and received her nomination and appointment to West Point. And I don't know if we have any West Point graduates in here or not, but Kimberly went up for a couple of weeks during these barracks and uh, she said, it's not for me. So 
for someone that doesn't want to be there, they don't need to be there. <laughs> they need to come home. She did. She came home. She went to Furman her first year and then transferred to Presbyterian College in Clinton. Uh, again, she excelled in the classroom on the tennis courts, and she was the battalion commander her senior year. One thing that we were especially proud of is that she was an academic All-American for two years. After her commissioning as a second lieutenant, Kimberly went to flight school. That's down in Fort Rucker, Alabama, and she was the first honor graduate there. The OH-58 Kiowa Warrior was her aircraft of choice. Camp Stanton, South Korea, was her first duty station. She spent two years flying the DMZ, and she did not realize it at the time, and we did not realize it, but flying those missions every day prepared her in a way that we didn't we didn't know about at the time, of course. This was in 2000 and then 2001. In August of 2002, she deployed to Afghanistan for a few months, and my husband and I treasure an email that she sent to us while she was there. I read it practically every day and draw strength from it. The last paragraph says, if there is anything I can say to ease your mind, if anything ever happens to me, you can be certain that I'm doing the things I love. I'm living my dreams for sure. I wouldn't trade this life for anything, so worry if you must but you can be sure that your only child is living a full, exciting life and is happy. Parents, you can understand this is what we want for our children. And to you students, that's what your parents want for you, to be happy. In June 2003, she fulfilled her dream of commanding an air cavalry troop. In 10 weeks after taking command, uh, her troop deployed to Iraq, and they were stationed near Fallujah. There was no infrastructure there at the time. If you remember, this was early in the war. They were at an old bombed-out airfield and they just had to just build everything, make everything happen. One of my favorite pictures is when the guys tried to make desk for them to work and to set up in a tent. Well, these guys were at least six foot tall or, or taller, and Kimberly had to sit like this. She was sitting and her hands were way up here <laughs> to work on her computer. Well, they took care of that. They made a booster, a booster seat for her so, <laughs> so she could see how to work. On the evening of January 1st, 2004, Kimberly spoke to her fiance who was in Baghdad. And she told him that the next day they would be carrying out their most important mission to date. The next morning, on January 2nd, while flying patrol over Fallujah, and this they were doing a roundup, the infantry guys were doing a roundup of black market weapons. An insurgent fired a shoulder mounted heat seeking missile from a rooftop, severed the tail boom from the helicopter, and our Kimberly deployed again. 
this time to our Heavenly Father. Just as our world became complete when she was born, it shattered that day when she died. Thank you again for having us here and for your interest. I met Anne and her husband, Dale, at this horrible point in their lives. The Greenville News sent me out to interview them because we learned that a young Easley woman had just died. About a year later, I got an email from them and they asked if I would consider helping them write a book about their daughter. They had two goals. One, because there had been an enormous amount of media attention to Kimberly's death, because she was the first female US pilot killed in combat, compounded by the fact that she really was such a stellar person, there was a lot of publicity about the death. Some of it was accurate, but there were some small inaccuracies here and there. Anne and Dale wanted an accurate record of Kimberly's life. That was their first goal for the book. The second goal for the book was to have a book that would be inspirational, perhaps, to other parents who had lost a child whether in war or whatever the cause. As we started writing this book, it grew into something more. Hopefully, we hope it is something that will also be inspirational to young people, university students, high school students, young people trying to follow their own dreams. I've been asked, wasn't this a horribly difficult story to write? And it really wasn't. What this is, what it turned out to be is really a love story. It's a love story between a mother and a daughter. Anne wanted Kimberly to be an English teacher and a tennis coach. Kimberly was flying and jumping out of helicopters and airplanes in dangerous places. And a mother who loved her daughter enough to support her in what she chose to do. I'm gonna read several passages from the book. This one, I think some of the students here in the room will identify with. You all have been making career decisions in the recent years of your lives. And Kimberly struggled over her career decision. She was pulled in three different directions. She couldn't decide whether she wanted to be a teacher and tennis coach, have a military career, or go into law. She agonized over her choices. And then in her junior year, Kimberly made her commitment to serve in the Army. Now the book is written in first person, so when I say I, this is Anne speaking. I went back to my friend, Colonel O'Kane, and asked if he would be willing to talk to Kimberly about what to expect from an Army career. He took Kimberly to lunch at the Commerce Club in Greenville one day. It was the summer before senior year, and Kimberly was leaving soon to go to ROTC advanced camp at Fort Lewis, Washington. I was fascinated by her perseverance and tenacity of purpose and resolve. She was really focused like a laser beam on what she wanted to do, Colonel O'Kane said. She wanted to be an aviator and a paratrooper, and Colonel O'Kane spent a good part of the two-hour lunch trying to talk her out of it. It was obvious that she had what it takes to be successful, but because she was a woman, he wasn't sure she'd have the opportunities to advance. 
I don't know if there's a glass ceiling, but my perception is that women have to work harder than men to get ahead in the army, he told her. Kimberly wasn't deterred. It seems you're determined, Colonel O'Kane told her, and pulled a silver eagle pin he wore as a colonel from his pocket and showed it to her. Look at the thousands of feathers on that eagle. Each feather represents thousands and thousands of soldiers, he said, and talked about the responsibility she would bear for many American lives as she advanced through the ranks. He handed her the pin and told her that all he asked was that if she did enjoy a successful army career, that she one day pass the pin on to another. Big tears came into her eyes, and mine too. And she said, I will do that. Now, I think everybody remembers where they were on September 11th. And Kimberly was in Korea flying helicopters on the demilitarized zone. And we have a little look here at what was going on there and at what was going on in Kimberly's mind. She's flying on the DMZ and she's worried about her mother working in a high rise building in Greenville. On September 11th, 2001, as terrorist hijackers boarded planes in New York City and began to carry out a plot that would soon send tens of thousands of troops to Afghanistan and Iraq, the air troops at Camp Stanton were planning and rehearsing for a large night assault training event. It was a fairly elaborate mission and the mood was intense. Suddenly, a staff duty officer who had a TV on began to shout about an aircraft flying into the World Trade Center. The day is etched in Mac's memory. Mac was a fellow who served with Kimberly and this is his version of his memories of that day. Everything stopped. We gathered around the TV and saw the second aircraft hit. It was pretty surreal. After we realized there was nothing we were going to be called on to do that night, we went back to our planning and to our rehearsals. We were just going to control the things we could control. Our job was to keep driving on with our missions to show the North Koreans how rock steady we were by doing what it is that we needed to do and other forces would take care of their responsibilities. We had a specific mission and we needed to continue to do it. We went out to where the air assault was for the rehearsal and the walkthrough. There was a large aviation task force out in the field that we were going to go out and support. The brigade commander called a formation in the field and explained to everybody who had been isolated and hadn't heard the news what had happened. Now we're back to Anne's memories. Dale called me at the office that morning and I knew when I heard his voice something was up. He wouldn't call me at work for casual conversation. He told me there had been a huge accident and a plane had hit the World Trade Center. And before I could get up and go check the internet, he called back and told me that a second plane had hit and it obviously was an act of terrorism. Word started spreading and in a large office environment, it doesn't take long for people to start getting upset. We had a portable television in one of the offices and we left it on all day and kept going by and checking to see what was happening. Rumors were flying and people kept coming by and asking me, have you heard from Kimberly? I was concerned for her, and at that point, I didn't know anything about the Taliban. I was worried that this could be a communist plot to overthrow, and there she was, just a few miles from North Korea, and I feared they could be coming down and attacking. I tried not to think about it and focus on my work instead, but it was almost impossible. All day long, people kept coming by my desk and asking about Kimberly, and every time, my fears increased. When I had visited Kimberly in Korea, it was interesting to see what she was doing and the places she went to, but it also made me worry more. On that first visit, she had taken me through a neighborhood up into the hilly terrain outside of Camp Stanton, where she ran every day. It was a scary place for me, partly because of the unknown and partly because living conditions were so different from what I was accustomed to. Kimberly thought it was a fantastic place. When she ran, people would recognize her and would wave or speak as she went by. Of course, we walked the day I was with her, and we didn't run. I remember how nervous I felt and the tension in the atmosphere the day we visited Penanjin on the North Korean border in the DMZ. 
I thought about Mrs. Hahn and how she reassured me that she was watching out for Kimberly. I wondered what Kimberly and Mrs. Hahn were doing and whether they were in any danger. It was a great relief to hear Kimberly's voice on the phone when she called early that afternoon. She made separate calls to Dale and me at our offices. Just answering the phone and hearing her voice say, hey, mommy. It was always music to my ears, and it particularly was that day. It was obvious she had been as worried about us as we were about her. What are you doing at work? You're in a high-rise building. Go home, she told me. I assured her that we were OK, and I told her I couldn't just leave, but she was extremely worried about me. It was all so surreal. She was in Korea and worried about us here at home, where we had always felt so safe. It really didn't sink in at the time that this could mean she'd eventually go into real combat. One of the things I enjoyed the most about writing this book was interviewing some of the military personnel who served in the places that Kimberly served in. And at times, I felt like I was a writer for National Geographic describing all of these wonderful places. And this is just a paragraph about uh, Afghanistan when she was stationed at Bagram. The mournful wail of a Muslim's call to prayer lingered in the air daily as people who lived in an adjacent village observed their sacred rituals. Small arms fire punctuated the darkness almost nightly around the perimeter of the base, although few rocket attacks were intentionally fired at the base. Most of the shooting came from local Afghans hunting, and in what seemed to be a common occurrence, locals simply firing shots into the air for no particular reason. Harrier jets, transports, and helicopters flew noisily overhead. There were occasional blasts from planned detonations of explosives by ordnance disposal teams, and every once in a while a landmine was accidentally set off by animals, people, or simply time. The dusty air smelled of jet fuel, trash, sewage, coal, and open-air meat markets in the villages. It was also an opportunity for me to get an insight into what soldiers do in their training. And if I started this project with an admiration and respect for those who serve our country, I ended this project with that a thousandfold. And one of the things that fascinated me was the jump training. It's a three-week course. The first week, they work on physical fitness and make jumps from some short stands. Then the second week, they graduate into some much taller towers. And the third week rolls around, and it's time for the real thing. Students must make five high-performance jumps from jets, land safely, and walk off the drop zone before they can graduate. The first jump is the hardest. As a jump master, Lieutenant Colonel Bricker saw a lot of first jumps, and this is his description. There are a lot of soldiers doing a lot of praying on that first day of jump week. It is really a leap of faith. These kids are in back of an airplane, and the airplane is roaring, and you're swaying. The aircraft moves back and forth, and the jump master opens the door. It's loud. You've got a lot of soldiers packed in back of an aircraft, and they've all got this equipment on, and the jump master's telling them to stand up and hook up, and they start to realize they're really going to exit an aircraft. Some of them start getting sick. During those first two weeks, we've taught them all the procedures, so it's written in their minds. So when they get into that aircraft and the door is opened up and the wind is howling through the aircraft, they pay attention to their equipment and they remember what we've taught them and they follow the instructions of the jump master as they exit the aircraft. 
There are no atheists on that airplane for the first jump. They are all praying. After they do the first jump, they get a lot of confidence, and they are much more aware of what's going on. The first jump, it's always been the one that I don't think any paratrooper will ever forget. The night before her first jump, Kimberly called her college friend Kelly. I'm pretty scared, Kimberly said on the phone. Kelly had never seen Kimberly scared. What are you afraid of? Kelly asked. Of dying, Kimberly told her. She asked Kelly to pray for her. Kelly and Kimberly had compared their beliefs about eternity and an afterlife in a running conversation over the years, but Kimberly had never talked about dying, not even when they watched Meg Ryan encourage under fire, and Kelly got upset. They prayed together on the phone. Kelly promised Kimberly she'd continue to pray. Now we're back to Anne. I was praying too, and worrying and driving. My baby girl had graduated from tennis serves to jumps from jets. I'd missed only a few tennis matches, and I certainly wasn't going to miss this. I drove from easily to Fort Benning to be with Kimberly when she made her jumps. I was still on the road when my cell phone rang. It was Kimberly. She had made her first jump. Her voice was filled with excitement. I'm hooked, she told me. I was just glad she'd lived through it. Now, this book tells the story of Kimberly's life. But as I said, one of Annandale's goals was also to be inspirational to other parents who have perhaps lost a child. And many things happened, maybe little coincidences, maybe small miracles, but many things happened every time Annandale would hit a low point that would help them to keep putting one foot in front of the other, give them just that inspiration they needed to go on with their own lives day by day. Kimberly's 29th birthday, Annandale, and on, on Kimberly's 29th birthday, Annandale were busy with their first Captain Kimberly Hampton Memorial Blood Drive. There is still every year a blood drive held on Kimberly's birthday. They co-sponsored it with the Blood Connection, an upstate blood collection agency in her memory. What do you want to sing? One of the workers at the Blood Connection asked me as they planned a small dedication ceremony to be held in the morning to kick off the blood drive. Lee Greenwood, I responded off the top of my head, singing God Bless the USA. I knew that getting the famous country singing started easily wasn't a possibility, and I asked Kelly Kirkland to sing. Kimberly's two favorite hymns were Great is Thy Faithfulness and How Great Thou Art. Kelly chose the first. She put absolutely everything she had into that song as she sang, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Dale spoke briefly, and when the ceremony was over, I went to give blood. It was something I had never done before. I didn't like needles, and I was nervous about the prospect. The nurse was beginning the procedure, and I was bracing for the needle when the woman I'd planned the ceremony with ran in and said, turn up the radio. Do you hear this? Lee Greenwood was on the radio singing, God Bless the USA. I figured the woman had called the radio station and requested the song, but she hadn't. It was just one of those coincidences, tiny miracles, just when I needed one. We spoke recently to Easley High AP English students and they came up with a very good list of questions for us that the teacher sent to us before the presentation. And one of the questions, we kind of sidestepped. 
they wanted to know how Kimberly's service, how this story may have changed our views on the military. We had decided in the beginning that this would not be a political book. We wanted it to be positive and inspirational, and we stayed focused on that goal. It's not a criticism of the war or the army, but the story of Kimberly's life told in a way to honor all soldiers. So when, when students asked whether Kimberly's role in the military affected our political views, we sidestepped. And I didn't read this to the, children, the students, I should have probably, but I found this passage, Anne and I were talking about it afterwards. And as a rising senior in 1997, a rising college senior, Kimberly wrote back from Fort Lewis in Washington. <clears throat> I'm training to be the best army officer I can be. I'll settle for nothing less than the best, my best. The US needs good, solid troops in the hot spots. That's where I want to be. I don't think I can serve in fear of being sent to war. Of course, we want to avoid war, but conflicts are inevitable. America's best should be devoted to serving in these conflicts without fear and without hesitation. I'm sure there are people who no longer support the US military or the government, but whether I agree with what we do or not, I have a duty and an obligation to serve. I may be one of the few people who still consider it a privilege and an honor to serve my country. I think y'all are in good company. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Anne. After a death in any family, I think particularly a child or someone very close to you, there are a lot of emotions that go, that you go through and a lot of steps that you have to take for your healing, if there is such a thing as healing. Writing the book, working on it with Anna, of course, was, was a big, big step. And to Anna's credit, I'll have to say there were many months that I would completely shut down and she patiently waited until I was ready to work again. <laughs> Um, something else that has made a huge impact on my life and therefore on the lives of my family members are trips that I have made. I've been able to go to the Kurdish region of Iraq three times now. The first trip came after I had been invited to a Hugs for Healing luncheon in Greenville, and other Gold Star mothers were invited also. And the purpose of this luncheon was to meet with a delegation of Iraqi women. It was hugs for healing. So I wasn't sure why we wanted to go hug Iraqi women and wasn't sure why they would want to hug us. but. I went, and I'm so glad I did, because that day and the subsequent events have been a huge turning point in my grieving process. The Iraqi ambassador to the United States was there, and he told us things that I had not heard on the, on the news. He told us of his country's love, of the people's love for the American military, for the United States, and for the sacrifices that our children had made for their freedom. The ladies hugged us. We did. We hugged, we kissed, and they loved to kiss. It's like you know, at least three times. <laughs> but 
even the ones who could not speak English could say, I'm so sorry and thank you. Those tears and hugs and kisses transcended all language barriers. That's a universal language. And my healing began that day. A year later, um, we had been planning because the ladies had said, come to our country. Well, we knew that was impossible. But we said, you know, okay, we'd love to come. Well, we found out it was not impossible. We began planning. We could not go to the areas where our children died, but we could go into the northern area, the Kurdish region. Uh, there were 10 mothers who went. I was still hesitant, wasn't sure if I wanted to go. Well, I knew I wanted to, but I just didn't know if I was brave enough, I guess. My husband said, I don't want you to go, but if you want to go, I'll support you. So we talked about whether Kimberly would have wanted me to go. I spoke to her fiance, who probably knew her better than anyone. He kind of gave me the thumbs up. He said, I would rather you go, and maybe it not be exactly what you wanted, than not go and always wish you had. Uh, I spoke to the commanding general of the 82nd Airborne. And I said, what do you think? Is it safe? And he said, and, and you'll find this probably kind of hard to believe. I did. But he said 95% of the people there are just like we are. They want a safe, secure, peaceful life. And he said, you don't speak the same language, you don't have the same religion, but still, we are one, one people. He said it's at 5% and the insurgents you've got to worry about. So I still had not definitely made up my mind, but we got the flight itinerary for the trip. And the flight number for the trip, which went from Amman, Jordan, over into Iraq. The flight number was 818. Kimberly's birthday was August 18th, which is eighth month, 18th day. So I had my answer. That was another <laughs> one of those little miracles we felt like that I was supposed to go to Iraq, and it was okay with my Kimberly. I don't know if you know very much about the Iraqi Kurds. I didn't know a lot about them until um, my first trip over. But they were hated by Saddam and were continually persecuted. While there, uh, we heard just numerous horror stories about how children were pulled from their beds in the middle of the night and thrown into mass graves. They were buried alive. The parents were prevented from getting to the children. Hundreds of villages were bombed with cyanide and other gases and there were approximately 200,000 people, 200,000 Kurds killed under Saddam. On the first trip, one of the uh, most important things that we were allowed to do is to have a private memorial 
for our children. So we went up into the mountains. We were real close to Iran. And we had, um, um, it was a beautiful uh, kind of resort area, a beautiful lake. And we had a, a private memorial, and then we had a group memorial. In my private memorial, I had a prayer shawl that was knitted by our knitters at the church, Pastor Bob. And our pastor at the time um, helped me with my uh, memorial my scripture and my prayers. And I took two Iraqi ladies with me. They spoke English and they cried more than I did. After I had my private little memorial, I buried a little red heart under a tree. It says, remember on it. One of the ladies that went with me has since gone up to this resort. She makes several trips up a year, in fact. And she put memorial to Kimberly, had a plaque made, and then a, a picture of Kimberly. And so the last two times I've been, I go and I add something new to the tree. But after we had our private memorials, we had a group memorial where we were all, now these are Iraqi ladies and American ladies, and we had a lot of security with us also. But each mother had the opportunity to get up and say something, whatever they felt. One mother read, a youth program that her son had delivered in their church when he was 16. I thought this was very insightful. He said, with peace, there is no conflict, no anger, no envy, no doubt, no fear, no hatred. There is only love. He died three years later on Iraqi soil. Another mother told that when her son was little, his favorite song was Amazing Grace, and she sang it to him and hummed it, and they would sing it together. He told her that when he was in a firefight, he would hum Amazing Grace, and she wanted to sing Amazing Grace to her baby that day. Well, Tammy has the voice of an angel. She sang the first verse. All of the Americans joined in the second verse. And for the third verse, we just sang, praise God, praise God. Every Iraqi in the group sang also with their hands uplifted. We, we were one that day. There was no difference. We were all praising our God. One of the villages that we visited is the village of Halupsha, and it's very close to the Iranian border. And it was one of the most, um, I guess widely known, widely advertised villages that, that Saddam bombed. In five minutes, 5,000 people were killed in one of the attacks. Some of the people who did survive live with severe respiratory distress now. We went to the museum in Halatsha, and we met a young man there. He's in his 30s. He was standing beside a picture, and the picture was of him and 
uh, some other children in the family. And that picture was taken the day of the attack. The rest of the family was killed and he survived, but with a lot of uh, medical problems. There's a monument in this, uh, right outside this museum. They call it the Mother's Monument. She has her head lifted to the heavens and her hands are up. It's just like she's begging God to say, this couldn't happen. Please, this didn't happen. And all of us knew what emotions had to be going through the people that went when they were designing and erecting that monument. I think visiting Halaksha provided me with the first real understanding of why our military was in Iraq. We, we saw many, many more villages. We met with widows. Saddam's campaign was called the Anfall Campaign. There, there are thousands of widows there. One widow whom we visited her home she lost 20 family members in, the, in one of the attacks. And she proudly told us that she was able to um, testify at Saddam's trial. That was, that was very, very important to her. My first trip to Iraq was a healing mission. My second two trips have been primarily humanitarian in nature, although I've always come home with more than I've given. I visited a refugee camp, hospitals, orphanages, women's shelters, and now I'm real proud that the foundation that I've traveled with the last two years, has established a free medical clinic for women and children. And there's also plans for a vocational center where the women can be taught a trade so that they can help support their children. All three times that I have left the country, I have a new peace in my heart. The mothers who went on the first trip said for the first time since their child's death, they could finally concentrate on their child's life, the life that was more important than the death. I think history will determine whether what we did was right whether we should have um, invaded Iraq. But I know that Kimberly's death was not in vain. Every mom on that first trip now feels that the world's a safer place because of the efforts of our military and our children's sacrifice. There was one mom who had been extremely bitter, had uh, participated in every protest that she could find, and she came home a new person. She, I think, made the biggest change, and I was so proud of her. But even though Dale and I, our family, Kimberly's friends, will always grieve her death. I'm at peace that she died doing what she loved and what she believed in. Thank you again for having us here. 
and for letting me give you, letting Anna give you a little glimpse of Kimberly and some insight into our journey to peace and reconciliation. Thank you. Come up and use this mic or one of these. Are the lapel mics, are these working? Where's the mic part of it? Do you want to try to use, is the lapel mic working? Do you want to try to use this? Let me bring this down to you. This question is for Mrs. Hampton. Um, as a future Air Force pilot, what is the best way to keep my family at ease and try to get them to understand what I do? Ooh. You know, I think if you, if you let them know how committed you are and how dedicated you are to what you're doing, I believe every parent, like I said earlier, every parent wants their child to be happy. And I believe they will be as proud of you as Dale and I were of Kimberly. Tell them to come watch you fly, too. <laughs> okay. Um. Ms. Hampton. Okay. Um, as a civilian traveling to various countries, such as Iraq and North Korea, and actually seeing the area, do you feel like sharing your experience will give some insight to the U.S. civilian population of what life is now like after the beginnings of the war? I think so, and, and let me correct you. I've been to South Korea, not North yeah. Korea. I've been the, oh, northern been part, yeah, the, the northern part of South Korea. But I, I do hope, I know that I've only seen a small part of both countries, but I have not, in Iraq, I have seen the area that is the most peaceful. I hope one day to go to Fallujah, but I can see so much of the way the Iraqi people live and and those in the southern part are the Arabs and you know and the Kurds. The Kurds are um, for the most part very peace loving people and I love to share the experiences. I'm glad we had a, a watch here or I probably could have talked on for a long time but I love sharing the experiences from there. Thank you. First off, thank you both for uh, being here. That was really inspirational. Um, from the passages, it sounded like um, people tried to guide Kimberly in various directions. What drove her to the lifestyle she chose and how can a college student learn from how she didn't let people influence her to going in, in different paths? I. Yeah, I think people, different people did try to influence her, but if any of you know, any of you Leos in here? Kimberly was a Leo. <laughs> she could be guided, but she couldn't be told what to do. <laughs> 
she, um, but she, if she had done what other people wanted her to do, she would have stayed at West Point. But I feel like it took a lot of courage for her because she was the first female in the area, out of Easley anyway, to get a West Point appointment. So I feel like she got to where she wanted to be and um, she took a different route getting there than, than the West Point way. What was the second part of your question, please? Um, what drove her and how can a college student um, like learn from how, how she does what she does? You know, it was, it was something inside of her. I always said that she did well in spite of my husband and me, not because of us. So it wasn't anything that, that we did. We saw this determination at a very young age. She was not supposed to be able to run. She had problems with her feet, wore the big, thick, ugly shoes until finally uh, a second opinion. The doctor told us to throw those shoes away and um, let her start playing like a, an ordinary child. And so we threw those heavy shoes away and she started running, even though she wasn't supposed to ever run, according to the first doctor. And she really never stopped running. She uh, had allergies, took shots every day, and you two probably know that you can't do that in aviation. And so she gave, gave that up, suffered through it. She also had scoliosis, really bad. And uh, even though she had gotten into West Point, she had to go into the ROTC on a, mili on a medical waiver. So there was, there was just a lot inside of her she knew we expected her to do her best, but we didn't expect her to be perfect. I think the perfection was what was inside her. If, God forbid, that a close friend, a relative, had a child that died, how would you inter try to interact with them, based on your experience? You know, I have found that some families do not want any contact with parents who have, have lost children. Some embrace us. Um, and it's something that, I mean, it's been almost nine years for me. Some days it's as if it was yesterday. Some days I, have, I just can't even be around people. That's the way a newly um, grieved parent usually is. Um, but we can, we can fill them out. We have an, an organization called American Gold Star Mothers. And we try to let the new families know who we are and that we are available for them. There is also a program called TAPS, which is a tragedy assistance program for survivors. TAPS has a 24-hour hotline, 
and I am a peer mentor with TAPS, and if there is someone that TAPS gets a call about and they feel like my experience would be beneficial to that person, they will call me. And this is nationwide. It's, it's very helpful. First, I'll make a quick comment, and one is, if, if your goal in writing the book was to make a grown man cry, um, you can just ask my wife, who while I was reading the book, and she'd come into the dining room, and I would be sniffling, and she'd say, what's wrong, what's wrong? It's the book, it's the book. But it's really a gripping, gripping story. Um, Anna, my, my question, I guess, may, might be more for you. Um, I was curious, the book is written in first person, did, did the two of you, I, I kind of wondered how that decision was, was made, it was, was that, oh, it just has to be this way, or did you kind of go back and forth about how you were going to do that? It didn't start out that way, and we wrote it in third person, and we had an agent, and our agent shopped it around it this big annual book event in New York, and she said, biographies, unless they're about someone famous, Winston Churchill, Marilyn Monroe, Madonna, <laughs> are not selling. And we rewrote the book as a mother's memoir. And I think it became more powerful when we did it. I think it's a much better book. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. We do have one more question out here, real quick. Did the government offer you any psychological assistance? I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Did the government offer you any psychological assistance? We. My husband and I were not offered anything, but from what I understand, um, I know that other families, Kimberly died early in the war, really, but families since then have been offered counseling, and I'm sure if we had approached the VA we would have been provided that. We have a strong relationship. It's amazing the family lives that I've been privy to where there is not a strong bond between husband, wife, mother, father, family, and, and they need the outside counseling. And we probably needed it, but we just, we leaned on each other, leaned on family and friends, and most of all, I think our faith in God. But yes, there is counseling through the Veterans Administration for families now, I know. Well, thank you very much. Once again, thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing Kimberly's story with us. We appreciate it very much.